Greetings, friends. So glad you chose to join us today here at Christ Church of Albany. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. Again, we just honor God today and thank God for our pastor, Sister Davis, returning home safely. And thank God for the word Sister Davis brought. Amen. Amen. Because it agrees with what the Lord had on my heart. And that goes in tune with uh, what Elder Oliver spoke about on Tuesday. So I'm really giving part B to Tuesday because it kind of bothered me when I walked in here and you was reading from my scripture for today. <laughs> I said, no, he ain't <laughs> preaching my message. <laughs> Praise God. But I just thank God for that. So... I would agree with what Sister Davis said about investment. And the way we make that investment, I think, was made obvious today. We have to open our mouths to make that investment. And so we praise God for the instruments on today. But I believe our greatest instrument is between our two lips, inside of our mouth. And I just want to deal with the tongue today. Amen. So we're going to go back to James chapter 3. We're going to start at verse 1. We're just going to talk about controlling the tongue, taming the tongue. You can't talk about the tongue without talking about the words like we spoke about on Tuesday, which was a good word. Let's read from the New Living Translation, if we got it, James chapter 3. We'll just start at verse 1. Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church, for we who teach will be judged more strictly. Next. Indeed, we all make many mistakes. Can somebody say amen? Amen. For if we could control our tongues, <laughs> we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. Isn't that amazing how the tongue just affects every area of our lives? Every, he said if we could control this little member, we could control every other way. Verse 3. We can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth. And if y'all watched the race Tuesday, you, yesterday, you saw that. And the small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go. Even though the winds are strong, it doesn't matter how strong the winds are blowing. If you can control that rudder, you can control where your boat is going. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. We see that happening where? In, in California and out west there, how those fires are just tearing everything up. Verse 6. And the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness corrupting your entire body. It's a whole, it's, there's a whole world contained in your tongue. God. And it corrupts your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. My God. Verse 7. People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish. But no one can tame the tongue. You know, I tried. There's a tongue back there I tried to tame. <laughs> you get your feelings hurt trying to tame somebody's tongue. <laughs> Ain't that right, Aretha? <laughs> you can't tame somebody's tongue. I can't tell her what to say and how to say it. But she know how to use it. It is restless and evil, full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. All right, God. And so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. Does a spring of water bubble out with both fresh water and bitter water? 
Does a fig tree produce olives or a grapevine produce figs? No, and you can't draw fresh water from a salty spring. Amen. I think I'm going to stop right there. So right there we get an element of how, how powerful and how important the tongue is in our lives. I just want to highlight this word about taming because I'm going to talk about taming the tongue. See, one, one thing I know that if you don't know the use of a thing, then abuse is un- inevitable. And if you don't know what your tongue is for, it ain't to curse. It ain't to speak bad words against people. But God created our tongue to give him praise. He created our tongue to bless people. So when it talks about taming the tongue, it talks about bringing into service or rendering useful and manageable. To tame means to bring under control as a source of power. It, change, it changes the wild and savage state, meaning if you wild, you tame it, you make it calm, and it c- cultivates the land. So if you don't know the use of a thing, you'll abuse it, and many abuse our tongue. We allow it to do and say and operate outside of its original design. So when you don't know the function and use, abuse will occur. Our tongues were designed for, one thing our tongue was designed for was communication. Somebody say communication. God gave us a tongue to communicate with him and with each other. So as we, as we just illustrated, I don't even have to preach this, because as we began to communicate with God, his presence came into the room. Amen? And what you need to recognize is that you'll, you'll tame your tongue when you recognize that your tongue is the key or the portal that connects our, our, uh, our earth with God's heaven. Our tongue becomes the portal that gives us access to God's presence. So you don't want to abuse the key that God has given us to access his presence. Our tongues are used to praise and glorify God. Our tongues are used to pray. So I guess I would ask that anybody use their tongue for prayer on today. Prayer is our communication with God. So our tongue not only connects us to God, but our tongue is used to communicate with God. Tongue, our tongue is used to talk to others, and that's why our words are so important and powerful. Elder Oliver asked about in our lesson on Tuesday, how are you using your words? And as we understand the power of our tongue, we need to recognize and consider how are we using your words. Let me ask a question. Since Tuesday, anybody who was here Tuesday, have you changed the way you've been using your words? It's important how we communicate to one another because our words hurt people, right? Our words, and when you've been hurt, you use your words to hurt. See, people who aren't necessarily big physically, those are the ones who got some tough words. I got a little Goliath. Now, he, he ain't a big dog, but you would think he's the biggest dog in the room when he starts barking. And some of y'all make a, make a lot of noise. Some of us have been good at cutting people with our words. Some, have made it, some of us have made it a practice of cutting people with our words. See, when you know you're good at a thing, sometimes you'll do something just to see what's going to happen. Y'all ain't never said nothing, not because you had to, but because you could, just to see what would happen because you said what you said. Just to get a react, just to see how powerful my words are. Some of you, y'all ain't never did this, but y'all have never started a rumor or y'all never gossip. Have you ever seen somebody throw something and then hide their hand? That's what we've done with our words at times. But God didn't create us to do that with our words. God said that uh, it's not always, oh, Jesus. Let's go to Matthew 12. I'm going somewhere. Stay with me. But we use our words to communicate. Matthew 12, 33 and 37. You can do that from the New Living. And I borrowed this from Tuesday night also. (laughs) 
A tree is identified by its fruit. If a tree is good, its fruit will be bad. I mean, its fruit will be good. If a tree is bad, its fruit will be bad. You brood of snakes, how could evil men like you speak what is good and right? For whatever is in your heart determines what you say. We'll stop right there for a second. So what they're saying here is that what's in your heart determines what you say. Now, also illustrated, when the Bible talks about heart, it references your spirit. So what's in your spirit? A lot of times is what you say. It also references your mind. And what I'm learning is that a lot of times what you say, it's not something that you just all of a sudden said. It's something that you said up here. (laughs) Before you said it, it was sitting back here somewhere waiting to be released. And so if you don't know how to tame your tongue, that thing will try to get to your lips and release itself. And we got to learn how not to release things that we know are going to hurt people. Uh, y'all probably never did this, but say something that hurt somebody and then try to come back and say, I'm sorry. Do you know that your words are eternal? That every word that you ever spoken is still out there somewhere. How do... And Elder Oliver made a great illustration when he talked about something that his father said in reference to him. He said it a a few years ago. He said it 57 years ago. 50 plus. You can still hear that same word today. How many of y'all still hear a word that somebody spoke to you 20 years ago? 10 years ago? Yesterday, that's, how, that's why we have to learn to tame our tongues, because some of us have been the one that said that word. And I know you thought, I know you said you were sorry, and ah, please forgive me what I said, but sometimes that doesn't take away the fact that that word is still right here. And you know some some words I've heard, it's amazing how the enemy remembers every word that was said to you. Now, I don't know how that thing gets brought up, but that thing will come out of nowhere. That's the last thing I'm thinking about, and then a word will pop up into my mind. So that's why you have to learn, because that which has happened to you, you want to prevent from happening to somebody else. And so we have to learn that our words are for communication, but the Bible says, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth except that which is good to the use of edifying, that you might minister grace to the hearers. And our communication one to another should be a word of grace that we minister. When we open our mouth, we should speak, and we should communicate grace and love, not uh, hate and things of that nature. So it's not always what you say, it's how you say it. Which also highlights another aspect of our tongue. And we talked about, it's not always what you say, but sometimes it's how you say it. And I can be more impacted by how you said what you said than what you said. And many times that has affected us. Let me go to the next uh, point here. So let's go to Genesis chapter 10. So we have to recognize that our powerful tongue is used for communication. 1031. And if we don't know how to effectively communicate, then we'll abuse, we commit tongue abuse when we don't use our tongue the way it was designed to be used. The territory they occupied extended from Misha all the way to Sifa in the mountains, in the eastern mountains. Keep going. Next. These are the clans that ascended from Noah's sons, arranged by nations according to their lines of descent. All the nations of the earth descended from these clans after the great... Can you put that in the King James Version? Sorry about that. Just go back to 31. 
These are the sons of Shem after their families, after their tongues, and in their lands, after their nations. Okay, keep going. These are the families of the sons of Noah after their generations and their nations. And by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. So he, he gave, he, he categorized them according to their tongue, according to their nation, and according to their generation, right? Next, verse 33. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. So that kind of, so they were divided by their tongues. They were clans and they were divided by their tongues. So I'm going to give you an example. Elder Oliver, you from Arkansas. Let me hear you say hello. Elder Nobles, you from where? The Mississippi kid. <laughs> Vincent, say hello. Where are you from, Vincent? <laughs> so listen to this, y'all. They all said a similar word, right? Now, we are all from the United States. But we have, we all speak the same language. But we have a different tongue. So this Nate, earth was filled. Everybody had the same language, but they had a different tongue. That means they spoke the same words, but the way they communicated one to another was different. Stay with me. What am I saying to you? What your tongue does is it identifies you. What do you say? From New York. New Yorkers have a different tongue. People from the South have a different tongue. But we all speak the same language. And many of us today operate like this. We all have the same language, but we all speak a different tongue. It helps to identify us. And the, what I'm saying is that your tongue ought to identify you. Let me show you one more thing. Acts 11 and 13. Is that the, he showed us how we had seen an angel. And, oh, I might have gave you the wrong scripture. That's not the right scripture. But in that scripture, we talked about how the scripture I wanted is how they talked about Peter and John. They were unlearned men. He said, you guys are unlearned men, but one, what happened? Your speech lets me know that you had been with Jesus. They, they, they had, why? Because they spoke the same language, but they had a different tongue. Oh, my God. What happens, y'all? Oh, I'm, I'm going to show you something. Mark. Chapter 16, verse 17. Mark. These miraculous signs will accompany, accompany those who believe. They will cast out demons in my name. Put it in the King James, please. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, and they shall speak with new tongues. When God saves us, I believe this to be, and when we get his spirit, we get a new tongue. We get a new tongue. So, with a new tongue, it doesn't matter that I stutter every now and then. 
It don't matter that I'm a boy from Arkansas. I have a new tongue. So I can sit next to you. I can identify with you. I know I'm from Mississippi. <laughs> Shabuda, is it Shabuda? And I know I might have got a zero. But the thing that identifies we with you and me is that we both got the same tongue. God gives you a new tongue, y'all. What I'm saying is that your tongue can be tamed because you don't have the old tongue. God has given you a new tongue. You got a new tongue. You just have to learn to operate in the new tongue that you have. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. Look at my hands. They are new. They forgot to put that my tongue is new too. You got a new tongue. You don't have to operate in the old tongue world. Because God has given you a new tongue that's going to identify you with him. If you're still cussing, then you can't. Now, you can, I'm, not, I'm talking about practicing it. Now, I know sometimes we get mad and we say something we shouldn't say. <laughs> Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. But I'm telling you, you can tame your tongue because you don't have a new tongue. The difference with your old tongue, you know why I don't hear stuttering when you speak? Because our new tongue it comes equipped with a sound that doesn't sound like the old tongue. I don't hear the stuttering. I hear the sound. See, when Sister Larissa plays a C on the keyboard and Sister Marquita plucks a C, it's the same note, <laughs> but it's a different sound. And God combines our tongues to create a sound unto him. What am I saying? You haven't, so don't be worried. Don't compare your tongue to my tongue. Don't compare the keyboard to the bass. Don't compare the bass to the bongo. Don't compare the bongo to the drum. It's a different, we're speaking the same language, but it's a different tongue. And God's created your tongues. He created our tongues differently. But we've been created to give him praise. But if you don't know the use of a thing, you'll abuse it. So sometimes, you, oh God, see, we, we feel inadequate in what we have. And when you feel inadequate in what you have, you're not secure about using the gift that God has given you. But you've got to recognize that the tongue that God has equipped, he didn't equip us with a new tongue to keep silent. God does not want you to walk around keeping your mouth shut. And that's why he gave you a new tongue. <laughs> that you can boldly confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. This new tongue, I believe, was infused with salt. Because <laughs> he said, let your speech be with salt, with grace, seasoned with salt. So your words ought to enhance every place you go. Your words ought to preserve things and bring light. And with these things that you speak, identify you with Christ. And that's the purpose of our tongue, that we can identify with Christ. This new tongue is, is a gift. It's nothing that you have to work for. You just got to believe that if you're in Christ, you have a new tongue. 
Don't be concerned if you don't dot every I, cross every T, if you split verbs and whatever. Know that your tongue is backed by God and that people won't hear what you, what you think they hear. They got to hear the spirit or the sound that's associated with your tongue. When God gave the, when the, when they gave the Holy Spirit came, there came the sound as a mush, rushing mighty wind. And then cloven tongues sat on each person. And the sound preceded them receiving the tongues. There's a sound associated with your tongue that people who hear will be able to identify with it. Your tongue was created for a certain people <laughs> that'll be able to hear the sound when you speak it. Proverbs 18 and 21. So your, your tongue was created for identification we just talked about. Your tongue was created also. I'm just going to use the word domination. Death and life are where? Death and life. Death and life are where? That's telling me that I have control over my life. If I'm going to live a life of an abundant life, it's going to be connected to what my tongue declares. If I want to live an abundant death, it's connected to what I've said. My question this morning is, what have you been saying to yourself? What have you said over your situations? Because when you recognize that your tongue is used for domination, then you'll recognize that you have to say what you want, not what you see. Actually, you're probably saying what you see. If you don't see yourself as God's, this is part of my prayer I've been praying recently. God, help me to see me like you see me. Because you see, you say what you see. So, no matter what condition I'm in right now, if I don't see myself out of that situation, I'm going to continue to say what I see in that situation. And what happened when Abraham, the Bible said Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, before God gave Abraham the promise, he changed his name. He changed what he started hearing because he called him Abram initially. He changed his name to Abraham, which is the father of many nations. So he called Abraham to be the father of many nations. That was the promise he gave him. What happened was Abraham had to change what he was hearing. And some of y'all need to change what you're hearing. As a matter of fact, I could probably tell you what you've been listening to if I just listen to what you start saying. If I listen to you for a little while... I can tell what you've been hearing. I can hear what you've been hearing. I can hear what you've been hearing by what you've been saying. And so Abraham started to hear that he was the father of many nations. Oh, my God. And he probably started to say it. And what happens, the Bible says that with the mouth, with the heart, Man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made to salvation. And see, like we said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Actually, faith is birthed in your heart. And what happens is, I think this is why we don't receive the promise sometimes. God said it this way, with me, you honor me with your lips. 
but your heart is on the other side of the room. And what happens, saints, in order, I believe, for us to get what we need from God or what you desire, your lips and your heart have to be in alignment. And so what happens, a lot of times we have to keep hearing <laughs> what your thoughts and what's in your heart is like 97% of, of, of what you say. Meaning what you say has less weight than what you've been thinking. I can say I believe God. That's the 3%. But my heart's saying I ain't quite there yet. It's, I, can, I can say amen to this one. I'm recognizing that I'm saying I'm believing. <laughs> but the Bible says that with faith, all things are possible, right? So if I'm not getting the all things that's possible, I know I'm saying it with my mouth. But the alignment hasn't occurred yet. And you have to be honest with yourself and say, I, you have to keep saying it until you believe it. You got to keep hearing it till you believe it. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. As When faith comes and you make that declaration, then that's what triggers the thing to happen. But there has to be an alignment with the heart and with the mouth. You can't have one without the other. Confession is, salvation is not just being saved. Confession means being healed, being delivered. It means being prosperous financially. Salvation encompasses a whole lot of things. It is the combination of the heart and the lips and alignment that helps you receive the promises of God. And so today I'm encouraging somebody, don't give up on the confession. <laughs> Keep confessing it until faith comes. If you're not getting what God said you should have, then it could be that you just haven't got it in your heart yet. And getting it in your heart is believing. Righteousness is, is God's, with the heart man believes unto righteousness. The righteousness is to be in right standing with God, right? The righteousness is, is really when you align yourself with what God says. When you believe that God says who he says he is and God can do what he says he can do, that's believing unto righteousness. And you got to come into that alignment where you believe that what God said, it is what it is. I can tell you that it's not, if you're not getting it, then it ain't, the word is true. So if you're not getting what you believe in God for, it ain't the word's fault. How about that? <laughs> so the word helps us to dominate our circumstances, to dominate our situation. Job's in Job 22, 28 says, decree a thing and it'll happen. You got to learn that that once that alignment occurs, you can decree a thing and that it would happen. God don't want you to be dominated by your circumstances, but he wants you to dominate your circumstances. He wants you to have control over your situations. Mark 11 and 22, put that up. Then Jesus said to the disciples, have faith in God. And I'm saying the same thing. Have faith in God. Verse 23. What is faith? Before I get, what is faith? Somebody tell me what faith is. Outside of the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I know that. But what is faith? See, we, I know that's way, I know the Bible says that, but you got to bring this thing home. And so many times, you know, we, it's way out there. Break faith down to me to the lowest common denominator. What would you say faith is? Somebody else. Somebody, somebody else. 
Somebody yell. You know why I'm asking y'all this? Because sometimes we take stuff for granted. And to get what you want from God, that thing got to be activated. I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I'm just trying to stir up the gift that's in you. And you can't be passive when you want something from God. And you can't be, what's faith? Faith is something that you got to be willing to, like, get aggressive for what you want from God. Abraham had to get aggressive in order to have a baby. Listen, if, if you want something, you have to go get it. And you have to activate the faith in you to get what you want from God. And just how we pass up sitting here today, that's how many of us live in our life every day. Want me to do this. Want God to do this. Here, Elder Noble, take that blessing. Elder Oliver, take this blessing. That's not how <laughs> it don't work like that. You got to have some, you have some say in what happens into your life. That's why you have to learn how to tame your tongue. No man can tame the tongue, but the, the Holy Spirit can tame your tongue. You have a new tongue that can be tamed by the Spirit of God. And your new tongue was designed to... What is the thing on the farm that distributes seed? I know sometimes you see it, they'll turn that thing and it shoots seed out. A spreader. Yeah, that's what your tongue is. Your tongue was designed to spread seeds. Where? Into your heart. If you don't spread any seed, you're not going to get any fruit. If you don't plant any seed, you ain't going to get no corn. See, our tongue is the vessel God uses to distribute the seed. The seed, Elder Oliver, has the capacity what? You talked about capacity in the seed. When you recognize how powerful your seed is, then you'll take care with your tongue how you distribute your seed. You can tame your tongue, but you got to know how powerful this little thing between your lips is. Don't take it for granted that God has given you this tongue. This tongue is a this tongue is a weapon, y'all. Most weapons that y'all have experienced has been somebody's tongue. The most thing that gets you upset is somebody start talking about you. They lose everything. God, don't let nobody talk about me. I'm going to lose my life to somebody talk about me. Don't call me no names. I wish they would. They, call, they said, what? What did they say? Isn't it amazing how upset we get about what people say? That's how powerful the tongue is. Y'all lose your religion over what somebody said about you. You know, recognize, saints, that the same thing that you is used against you is the same thing that you got to use to to take you to where you want to go. And you got to tame or or use a tame. Use your tongue as a source of energy, as a source of to produce what you want from God. Not don't use your tongue to tear yourself down, but use your tongue to build yourself up and to build up others. Actually, that's probably, 
It's going to be difficult to do it any other way. The Bible says to pray in the Holy Spirit, right? Building yourself up on your most holy faith. It's the tongue that helps you access the eternal. It's with your tongue that you communicate with God. Your tongue is a holy, oh my God. Your tongue should be holy. The Bible says, no, you shouldn't, your tongue should not be the vessel that you bless God and then turn around and curse others. It says that bitter water and sweet water should not come out of the same fountain. But how many of y'all have, don't raise your hand. One second, <laughs> you go to the fountain, one second, get sweet water. <laughs> come back the next second, it's bitter. We leave here, sweet water, as soon as you get outside. We can tame our tongue. That's, that's the point I'm trying to make. So our tongue is used to communicate. Our tongue is used to dominate. Our tongue is used as identification as we identify ourselves with Christ. I believe this hinders. So what we're saying hinders us from receiving from God. We may say what God says, and again, we can't say what God says because we don't see what God is saying. Jesus said, listen, the only thing I say is what I hear my father say. And we got to get to a point that we got to say what we hear. So, so if you're not saying what God says, then who, who, who do you hear? You must see yourself as God sees you. Activation has to do something, and it takes time. That's why we have to tame our tongue to say what God says when we don't see the manifestation of what he said. I'm going to be closing now. How do you tame your tongue? I know everything you said is good, and I got an understanding about how powerful my tongue is, but yet... How do I tame my tongue? The Bible says to yield our members as members of righteousness. And I think the first step in taming your tongue is you got to be willing to yield your tongue to God. You got to be willing to say, Lord, number one, I only want to say what you want me to say. I don't want to lie. I don't want to gossip. I don't want to backbite. I don't want to do those things with my tongue anymore. Okay, when we talked about this more, you got to be real with God. Lord, I got a problem with my tongue. I tend to lie, Lord. I don't mean to lie, but I lie. It just comes out. That's what, how you, Lord, I don't want to cuss. I'm tired of screaming at Aretha all the time. Lord, I shouldn't be doing that. I shouldn't be yelling at the kids constantly. I got to put this tongue under subjection, Lord. I submit my tongue to you today. You got to admit the, the issues that you're having with your tongue. I believe that's the first step. Yield your tongue as a member of righteousness. I think Job said, I'm going to put a watch on my tongue. And as you yield it, it may not, some, so some people it's going to happen overnight. For some people, it might not. So put a watch on your tongue. Keep a guard over it. Be conscious of what you're saying. The Bible said be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. And I believe put a watch over your tongue. Don't be so, in the, if you read through Proverbs, it just talks about so much about the person who's quick. Sister Oliver talked about the fool. What was that saying you said about the fool? Do you remember? Saying what a fool says. Right. It 
Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Some of y'all, you show your hand when you open your mouth. You tell a lot about yourself. So, amen. So we can put a watch on our tongue. Another way we can do is we can pray. David said, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. So after you confess, you know, all the wrongs that you've done with your tongue and recognize, God, I need you, you can pray that God helps you to change this new tongue that I got. I got to learn how to use it the way you want me to use it. And another day, another way I believe is that you command your day. In other words, get up every morning and purpose in your heart. Say it with your mouth. Today, I ain't going to lie once today. I commit today I ain't going to cuss nobody out today. I, I commit today I'm not going to get into an argument with anybody. I commit today I'm going to hold my tongue. If somebody comes at me sideways, I'm just going to walk away. I mean, I'm making a commitment today. I'm going to verbalize it that I'm going to put a watch on my tongue today, and I command my day to be fruitful. I command my, I'm going to speak only good things today. The girl that's been looking at me sideways all week, today I'm going to say something nice to her or him. I'm taking command. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tame my tongue. Your body shouldn't control you. And I'm making a commitment today to tame this tongue, this unruly thing that will mess up my whole life. We read that in Proverbs that your tongue can ruin your whole life, ruins everything. And some things in your life have been ruined by something that you said. So make a commitment to take command over your day. Get up every day and confess what you're going to say and what you ain't going to say and how you're going to behave with your tongue. And then the last one, just renew your mind. Don't be conformed to this world because this world nowadays just basically says you can say whatever you want to say. Do whatever you want to do. It's a Burger King society. You can have it your way. Everybody can say what they want to say but people who stand for Christ. Now I'm offending somebody. But you got to, the Bible says don't be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And if you keep your mind renewed every day, you can, can, you can tame your tongue. You can tame that unruly member that shaped the whole world. Listen, they didn't kill Jesus for the miracles. They killed him because of his tongue. He was saying stuff that disrupted the whole, their whole paradigm. Martin Luther King changed the world, not with these, but his tongue. And God said, you can change your whole, you can, ch God created the world with words. He spoke it, and it came to be. As a matter of fact, he sustains the world with his word. The word is so powerful that God took the word and made it flesh. And that word dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Listen, y'all, part B, as you learn how to uh, deal with your words and deal with others with their words, you can do it because God has given you a tongue that he's allowed, that is tameable. And if you choose to tame your tongue, you'll choose to create a world that is without limits. I'm saying one more thing and I'm going to sit down. See, your tongue, the, God said I could do exceedingly abundantly above all that you can even ask or think about. Your thinking and your asking is all, re, they're related. And if you don't say anything, you'll never get more than what you say. When you say something, you challenge, you put a demand on that to produce more than what you said. If you say little, you're going to get little. If you say big, you can have big. But your tongue can be tamed, y'all, to possess all that God has called you to have. Amen?